Andy Rayner. Uh, Andy, if you would, hello. Go ahead and share your screen. And I know you're going to talk about leaving legacy behind. Wonderful. Hey, great to be with you. Hello again, wherever you are. In a good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening even. Um, it's just late afternoon here. It's been a gloriously sunny day and it's just started raining about five minutes ago here on the east coast of the UK. Yeah, so I'll explain the topic a little bit as I go. But be first, before, it's always good to have a commercial at the beginning and end of, 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 a, of a little presentation. So I thought it was just worth pointing out that there is actually now available some excellent diversified content on the VSF YouTube channel. I'm sure you've got it bookmarked as an essential YouTube channel for yourself. But not only do we have unbelievably excellent technical tutorials, we also have um, how to make cups of tea and coffee information available on the YouTube site. So do check out all of the videos from VSF, especially how to make a cup of tea. More of that later. OK, commercial break over. What I want to just get us thinking about, and I, this is to start the ball rolling. Um, those of you involved in AIMS, um, Mr. Mayot got a little discussion on this going a few weeks ago, and I'd already been considering this, so I thought it was worth um, getting us some thinking. Um, as we've actually built up a legacy of the way we do stuff in broadcast over the last, well, 90 years almost for television, um, it, there's, there's, there's some stuff that it would actually be really good to shed. And we've made one or two vague attempts or um, half-witted attempts to actually shed some of the legacy that we carry, but others remain with us. So um, at the end, I'll be asking you to think about um, what we think we can actually abandon moving forwards. But before that, I want to explore the technology journey. Um, and I'm also doing, going to bring in a couple of slides that I missed being able to present a couple of months ago at VidTrans because I had a breakdown in communication at the end of my session. So the traditional broadcast chain that I guess all of us on this are involved in to some degree or other, whether it's at the acquisition end, whether it's within the production environment or the actual emission to the to the end users. This is kind of a typical um, quite UK centric view of, you know, what we do with broadcast. We have events which are covered typically with you know, the trucks on site or we have the studio and that's the new television, new broadcasting house there. Um, and then this is our local transmitter here, um, subroute transmitter here with terrestrial emission to the house. So that's to the homes. That's traditionally what we've done. You know, where are we heading? Well, of course, the content is still being generated at the front end. So you still need the cameras, the acquisition. You're still having the events running. But more often than not now, you know, we're, most of that processing is tending towards you know, being based on compute, be that within within the facility or in a in a data center at the top there in the middle. And and then, you know, still actually using some tactile surfaces to actually control stuff. Um, but those can be a long way away. And I put that picture of a house there because as we've seen in the last year, you know, a lot of people are actually doing a lot of tech ops from their house. Um, dr driven because they have to, but I think it's actually shown the capability. And then, interestingly, you know, the emission is heading much more towards being internet-based. Um, and it's interesting to look at even what I would call conservative with a small C broadcasters in Europe. You know, there is lots of visions that in you know within a ten-year window, the the primary emission format for even traditional broadcasters is going to be OTT internet delivery, not terrestrial cable satellite delivery. And of course, the consumption model that, that people have, you know, we've got those transmissions over on the left. The consumption model is changing, you know, from linear, a lot more on demand content, even from the traditional broadcasters, you know, a lot of that being delivered to mobile devices and being delivered online. And many of you will have seen this slide. I showed it a couple of months ago, but I think it's just worth um, putting up because this is kind of my end game slide. Um, where I think we're heading. We've got the acquisition, um, you know, of, which is obviously a real time process on the left. We've got the consumption, which by the time the person's actually viewing or listening to it, it's a real time process. We've got people involved in that, in the in the production, in the gallery, in the in the vision, in the sound mix area, etc. But apart from that, you know, the 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 processes of doing the production. Um, need to be completely time aware, but they don't necessarily need to be um, traditional processing elements in the mindset that we have actually had for the last 80 years and unpack that a little bit more later. 
then we think actually what you know what what is the industry heading towards what are, what are broadcasters or content providers producers looking for and you know and my my take of most of the interactions i have um is they're looking for lower cost in the way they do their productions and they're looking you know, quite often which may be you may think contrary to that they're looking for how can we create higher creative production value within the production so we're seeing both of these hand in hand driving the way things are working but anyway let's rest there in a minute just dive back into time again i think i did show this picture um a couple of years ago at one of the events but i, I pull it up again just because i think it's an interesting as this is actually only this picture was actually only updated um just 31 years ago and this was the coaxial relay relay switched or manually patched OB network for London. So these are all the kind of key places where they may wanted to do an OB. So this was obviously an analog um, composite video outside broadcast network with um, large coaxes going everywhere. And these were the different places that they were routed to. But as you'll be aware, we had lots of issues like, you know, um, you length dependent degradation of signals um, amongst other challenges there. And this actually is the box in Downing Street um, or was the box in Downing Street. I think it's been updated since, but um, some 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 legacy technology and jumping back even more. This is from 1928 in, a, in radio news. This was just looking at when they did the very, very first mechanically driven single single cell um television mechanical television delivery so this was going so this is coming up for a hundred years ago and we're now looking at the the innovations here but the reason i want to put this up is some of the concept of this we're still living with even now in the way things are done and i know i've definitely shown this picture before um this is i think the first like captured piece of video and again this was done with a single sensor with a flying dot flying light scan on, on Betty Bolton. I think this was the first transmitted um, picture. And as you can see, those that alert the, the raster scan is actually uh, vertical rather than horizontal in that first test picture. So you'll be familiar with this. I'll come and unpack this in a minute, but this is a, just the example of a video waveform. But we then move forward to, you know, some of the legacy that we're now actually living with and, and the raster scan. So there was unbelievable pioneering engineering happened, you know, 100 years ago to get television working. When, when you consider the resources and the technology available, it's nothing short of miraculous what we actually managed to achieve. So we've got we've got this way we did it. There was you know, that we were scanning. We were scanning the 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 tube and, and getting a line of picture. Then we had those purple lines, the flyback another line, flyback, another line, and then we had the massive flyback. Once we'd got all the way down with our horizontal scan to the bottom right, we then just scan all the, jump all the way back, fly back to the top left to be able to start again. And, you know, in with, with real analog electronics, those flyback periods took time. So the methodology that we created was to have, uh, you know, allowances for those flyback times in our picture transmission and in the way it's handled and those again are things that we we're living with in addition once we actually start created that we, as well as the synchronization we introduced the color burst and we'll come on to that in a minute this was a lot to allow us to actually overlay color subcarrier in the same system that's one of the legacies that fortunately we've pretty well got rid of apart from still having to do some filtering on some legacy content so interlace so um, Theremin, um, the Russian guy, was the guy that actually originally invented the concept on mechanical television of, of interlace. And then um, both a German and a US engineer, I think, in parallel um, patented the concept of, of interlace video. And why, why was interlace invented? It was invented as a form of compression. They were aware of the update rate that the eye needed to have the human psychovisual system to perceive constant motion and yet if we go back to the thermionic valve in the 1930s at 50 hertz it could only cope with a resolution you know the limit was about 200 lines which wasn't sufficient resolution so the really really clever concept was okay let's actually scan half the picture 
now and then f f the other half and fill in the fill in the gaps um you know half the time time period later and in the in the beautiful um uk world that's you know we're, we're talking about 50 hertz and 25 hertz so we're actually uh, i say that tongue in cheek um run back so we we fill the color subcarrier and and that that interlace is still certainly in europe the predominant format that we're using now even though it's kind of insanely unnecessary um that kind of compression you know, there have been several points. The bodies like the EBU in Europe have pointed out that the um, you know interlace is is very problematic and far less efficient from a compression video compression perspective, etc., etc., etc. But even though we've persisted, I, I know in the US several several of the key broadcasters um, are actually you know have been more future looking and they've gone for um, progressive much earlier than we than we've done in the in in the UK. Fortunately. Interlace is one thing that is disappearing with ultra high definition. So although some things are still with us with UHD, we have actually we are actually getting rid of or have got rid of interlace. And then, of course, there was color subcarrier, another really clever way just modulating that color difference signal into part of the spectrum where the sound was. And of course, then there's fractional frame rates and some slightly strange, but obviously very clever at the time thinking, rather than just slightly offsetting the sound subcarrier, we'll actually screw the whole video up um, for the next hundred years and do fractional frame rate. That was a decision, I think, of, of, the, of, of some engineers back in 1953 to actually create that, but driven by the introduction of the color subcarrier. So, so those are some, some legacy, as I said, subcarrier is not with us now, but interlace is still giving us some challenges now, as is the inherent raster. And that's still, that's still living with us at the moment. So we then have SDI. So what did SDI bring? Well, it brought us a way of digitally carrying all of that information. And very cleverly, what we decided to do, which we'd started to do with analog tillage anyway, was make space so rather than getting rid of the raster which we couldn't really do because at the time sdi was invented there was still a large amount of crt based um viewing devices so so the the legacy was still needed for you know analog crt display mechanisms but we we actually get make good use of the horizontal and the vertical flyback times scanning flyback times to actually carry time code, to carry other signaling information, and to carry an awful lot of audio information. But at that point, we as broadcasters were still responsible for the physical layer of transport. So you know, there was a definition, and there still is a definition, um, uh, of, for the physical transport layer of SDI. And uh, those that were, like I was, playing in the early 90s with it, you know, we very quickly discovered those pathological data values that propagated you know problems with clock recovery or problems with with lasers when we were actually modulating to optical fiber because we had a very physical physical transport layer that we as broadcasters were responsible for and then as we try to transport that over infrastructure um starting with pdh at the top there and, and then um sonnet or sdh in the middle and then um you know, packet delay variation from packetized networks at the bottom. You know, we've actually had to cope with timing uncertainty in the transport layer that's actually potentially had an impact on the way we've actually derived um, our signal. And very especially, um, this was a big issue when we still had subcarrier because the requirements for the accuracy of subcarrier, which I'll mention briefly in a second, um, were, were, were very critical. So coping with the timing in transmission. But the great thing we've now done effectively as we've moved to IP technology is as broadcasters, we've actually made ourselves, if you like, non-dependent on a underlying physical transport mechanism that we're responsible for. So we actually interface, you know, at a packetized level. So that obviously brings with it a lot of challenges of its own, but we're not having to worry about that physical transport layer. These guys that are doing 100, 200, 400 gigabit per second interfaces, although they're still actually running as 100 gig lanes, um, are doing just crazy stuff. Um, and But we're leveraging the benefit again of the IT industry. So we're riding on the backs 
of of the of the innovation that's happened and what do we what are we looking for you know moving forward you know what we need from the infrastructure providers we we need integrity obviously we need consistency of delivery that's the you know the the, the timing of the delivery um we need the lowest possible latency and we'll talk about that briefly and the ability to carry the relevant timing information along with the data so those are the key things now, starting to think about what I was trying to get to on this talk, which was um, leaving legacy behind and um, looking here at the, if you like, the different generations from the top down, I couldn't flow across of, of the different ways things are interacting, because I think this is important as we think about the legacy and how it's being carried through the transmission chain. So when we were originally doing transmission, where we still had effectively color subcarrier downstream of us, then we had requirements on timing accuracy that we had to adhere to, even in our SDI plane, which wasn't necessarily tied so tightly because we were going downstream. We then moved to obviously gradually emitting um, as an all digital workflow. And most countries had analog switch off um, a long time ago. So we've been living now. Currently, the majority of people are actually you know, being served digitally with um, with some digital technology delivered. But the, the end game, as I said, e that even the most conservative broadcasters looking to is effectively, you know, an IP infrastructure for production and an internet over the top internet delivered um, mechanism of actually getting the content out. I think I'll leave this because um, the, the legacy subcar, we've just talked about that, the accuracy of the frequency recovery that we could do that actually adheres to that. And the reason I'm mentioning this is some of these specifications or some of these design elements are still kind of, we're still living with at the moment in things. And there's good reason because still in parts of the broadcast chains that we're all involved in running with, there are engineering limitations that exist simply because there are still some traditional you know, electronics that are actually doing that. So if you've got SDI, native SDI transport um, uh, uh, over things like fiber or anything else as part of a system, you've you've got some kind of TCXOs involved. You've got phase lock loops that are that have got a specific recovery range that they can cope with. By the way, vastly more than the PAL subcarry or and NTSC subcarrier limitations were gave, giving us, but they are still they are still limited. They are still some limitations that we need to live with in terms of the chain. I nicked this um, slide from from Ross from the BBC because I thought it was a good it was good concept about you know all or several of the reasons that we actually wanted to move to IP. But just jumping from there to ST twenty one ten just for one minute to look at some of the aims that we had with twenty one ten. And one of the things that we did try to do, and I do remember some of the conversations in the you know, in the, the calls in the early um, standardization of 2110 was actually trying to make a break in terms of the concept of 2110 with some elements of Rasta. As you'll see in a minute, we haven't quite achieved that, but we, we, we've, we've actually achieved a fair, a fair bit of stuff. We've obviously got a lot of agnosticism we've, we've inherently got now a flexibility that's, you know, we're not locked to certain spatial or um, temporal resolutions or bit depth, et cetera, within what we're doing. Um, and with, there was a very specific aim that we would only carry active media data and specifically with the video, the whole point of you know, the video essences in 2110 is they're not carrying that legacy blanking interval. Whereas obviously 2022-6, um, which is the, you know, the first IP packetization of SDI actually carries the whole shebang. So everything in your horizontal and vertical blanking is, is carried. But it's also worth observing as we will in a second that there's actually some, some legacy we're still living with there. So the IP journey, I haven't had my train set out for many years now. I think I last used this about four years ago, but I thought I'd get it out and add a carriage at the end. And the reason that I want to add a carriage at the end is the work we're starting to do within the VSF, amongst other places, is starting to look at what happens when we go to compute. And very specifically, there's a there's a work there's a work group at that John and I are co-chairing, um, which is looking at what happens within cloud. And although we're talking about cloud, that term, you know, what we're doing is generic principles for actually handling media on compute. And and in many ways, we actually we are forcing ourselves, we or we need to be forced to leave the legacy 
of some of those elements of the Rasta, the elements of some of those other things behind as we move into this era. So just stepping up very quickly. So the overall the overall ecosystem here, you know, you know, that's if you like the, the standard building blocks from left to right there, the acquisition, the processing, and then the publication. Those are all the key things. Management is becoming more and more important. Um, you know, we we've been doing significant management elements of what I call physical infrastructure. So you heard a bit about some aspects of the discovery network just now. You know, Video iPath is actually managing all of the con all of the SDN orchestration of all of that network and things like that on massive scale in the physical network in the physical world are, are are needed but we need to do that management just as importantly in the virtual world the virtual routing the virtual time management and and the virtual assignment of resources this is kind of a another if you like look at the potential end game scenario just looking at it from a different facet, as you will see, we've introduced here the concept of public cloud and private cloud. You know, those probably are the, are the processing options, although obviously you'll see as well in here at the event location or at your central facility, those cogwheels are still there. So what we're seeing probably in a distributed production is that processing will be distributed as well. And again, that means that some of those legacy approaches to the way we handle data need to be looked at. We've also introduced, you'll see there, home remote surface control there, top right, and radio infrastructure, which we'll come on to very briefly. Just very quickly, and uh, coming into land in a couple of minutes now, um, we've talked about convergence here um, or, you know, in the IP world, but actually, as as you'll see along the bottom, as as we leave our legacy behind and move to a, you know, if you like, non-linear timing related live production workflow at the bottom, then at all of the non-linear editing that we do, the, the both the craft production editing and the in-program NLE actually becomes much more synergistic, and there's much more coupling that it can be done between those work between those processes. A couple of slides, which I think I tried to show last time, but ran out of time. So what, we, what we've been doing in 2110 is, is actually very specifically capturing the moments that we actually acquire the media. And as we move forward and get rid of some of the legacy, a lot of the legacy time bases we live in, the raster, et cetera, the one thing we have to do both with the vision, like here, and the audio, is make sure the timing information of the acquisition of those moments of those media elements actually stays with us. Whether or not we're subservient to the, the linear workflow that we've been used to due to that raster propagating things, I just put this SESTI 2110 slide in just to show that actually we're still carrying this legacy. The narrow gap at the top, which is one of the one of the um, timing things, is actually just is basically allowing for our almost 90 year old flyback to the top of the CRT. That's why that's in there, because we've propagated that function. So moving forwards, as we move to a more compute based workflow, you know, we're going to be handling bursts of data. So none of these will be relevant within the compute. But actually, as we come out of compute, we'll be actually doing things in a much more linear or wide base under here. So what matters to the content consumer at the far end? What, what's important to them? Um, well, basically that they actually get uninterrupted viewing and, and the method by which their device actually brings the data to them and actually reconstructs it is, is, is almost becoming agnostic. Um, I mentioned the fact that we need to look at time management in the, in the virtual world because we need to carry timing information with us. And if you're interested in more, do join the GCCG workflow. But the question I want to ask you with at the end at the end now is what legacy technology elements can we cast aside? We were doing some musings that we might actually start to look at what tolerancing in systems we can slacken off with maybe a recommended practice or something to actually try and capture some of these things that we've still been living with that maybe at this point we can make a cessation with as we as we move forward so if if you've got specific things you'd like to contribute to the we can really live without that now or that's unnecessary moving forward then let's let, let's get that in the mindset so what do we need moving forward we want location independent both the acquisition for the event the operation of 
the technology and the delivery of it. That needs to be location independent. So that's why we're bringing in potentially radio technology into the mix, as well as obviously the fiber infrastructure that we've got. We need sufficient media quality to actually allow us to do what we need to do for that kind of production and low enough latency for operation. And that's where one of the challenges that we're you know, starting to look at within the production is how can we actually optimize latency in, in a compute workflow? So just going back to this picture to remind you about the end game, this is where we're heading. So anything that we can shed now of the legacy technology that disencumbers us um, so we can actually move forward to a new way of thinking about the way data is handling, I think, is really important. OK, that was a whistle stop through there. So it just remains for me to invite you whenever we're allowed to mingle again to actually come and have a cup of tea with me. And if you'd like to see how to make a cup of tea in the meantime, don't forget to go to the VSF YouTube website alongside all the technical offerings. There you go. Very brief overview for me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andy. Very much appreciate it.